Well, hey there. Welcome to the Kim Constable Podcast. Nobody cares. Work harder. So, how are you all doing this week? Did you enjoy the menopause podcast last week? Not sure if you have listened to it or not, or maybe this is the first podcast you've ever listened to of Kim Constables, and if it is, welcome. But last week, we discussed all things menopause-related, and the comments came flooding in, and the reviews came flooding in. You guys are absolutely loving what I taught, saying that um, I broke it down into really easy-to-understand um, I don't know, information, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And I'm glad that you loved it as much as I loved teaching it. And because you guys loved it so much, we are going to do a menopause part two. So yes, this is menopause part two. Um, I just wanted to go a little further into into the science, I guess, and into the metabolic processes that happen in the body during menopause. Um, and even if you're not in menopause, don't turn the podcast off because this information I'm going to teach is if you're a bit of a kind of an information junkie like I am and you enjoy learning about the body and the role of carbs and insulin and all that kind of stuff, I'm going to break it down into really easy to understand digestible bites today. And you might just find that this information will help you in your muscle building journey and or in your um, bodybuilding journey or even just to lead a healthier life. So definitely stick with it. Even if you think it's not for you, you might find that actually it is. So before we we get started. Uh, last week, we chose a podcast winner who was Devon Britton. Devon Britton chose Basement Jacked, uh, one of the Sculpted Vegan programs, as her program of choice. Congratulations, Devon. And what did Devon do to win a Sculpted Vegan program? She simply replied to the email that we send out with details of the podcast every week. And she told us what she would like to hear in the podcast. And she was chosen at random from the emails that we received. And she won a Sculpted Vegan program. So if you too want to be in with the chance of winning a Sculpted Vegan program, make sure you are on our mailing list. And whenever we send out the podcast email each week, simply hit reply, let us know what you want to hear in the podcast. And we could, well, you may be chosen as one of our podcast winners. Okay, so I'm just going to get right into it this week. I didn't tell very many stories last week because there was so much information to give you guys, but I am going to start this week um, with a story, and that is about me whenever I really, I guess, first started on my bodybuilding journey. It was just before I started my bodybuilding journey, but it was when I really started to go down the rabbit hole. I have always been like a real information junkie. I have just, I just love information. I love teaching. I love absorbing information and I love knowing how things work. Whenever I was a child, I remember I used to take things apart all the time. So you know, I just loved figuring stuff out. And this is maybe where I got it from. You know, we lived beside my grandparents. So my grandma and my nana, who were was my mum's, no, my dad's mum and my dad's grandmother, they lived together and their house joined onto our house in the country. And so therefore I grew up, you know, with a very, very close family. And my grandma was just the most loving, wonderful woman. And so was my nana. And they used to call me in all the time to fix stuff. I think there must have been one day I specifically remember that they called me in and they were like, oh, Kimmy, we just can't get the VCR to work. So it was, you know, the VCR that used to play videotapes. And I remember just sitting down and thinking, you know, I really wanted to help her. And I just pressed a couple of buttons and I kind of figured out what looked like it might make sense. And, you know, the VCR started working and they were like, oh, you're so wonderful. You're so amazing. That I can't believe you figured that out. And I remember them telling everybody about, you know, me figuring this out. And I guess me being able to figure something out and help someone with that information probably, you know, that as a postulate when I was a child stemmed my love of learning and my love of information. And it never, ever went away. And I, I remember I've told this story a couple of times, but for those of you who are new listening to the podcast, you may not have, you may not know it, but I went away with a boyfriend whenever I was, uh, I think about 19 or 20. I think it was about 20, maybe 21 actually. And we, uh, I was working um, in a restaurant at the time, so I didn't really get any uh, decent time off. I was off like random days, Mondays and Tuesdays and that kind of stuff. And so my aunt had a house um, at the beach. Now it sounds very glamorous, but it wasn't. It was literally just a house. And the only thing <laughs> that there was in the place where the house was, 
was a beach and the beach was just across the road. So we decided that we would go up there and stay. And the, now quite you know close by, there were some really good Irish pubs and stuff. So we thought we'll go there and stay for the night and kind of get away from it. So we went up there to stay the night and we ended up um, going to, you know, a local fishing town and we ended up then going to some of the local Irish pubs and it was really good. But whenever we were back at the house, I had forgotten to bring a book or a magazine or something to read. And that was in the, the days before iPhones. I mean, well, we did have a phone, but it was just, a, you know, a phone that you kind of, you know, pressed buttons on. There was no like, um, what do you call it, like touch screens or anything like that. You couldn't watch anything on it. And so... Um, and there was no TV in the house either. So I was starved of reading material. And I remember I, I went around the house looking for things to read. And they were big golfers. That's why they bought the house down there. It was right beside the golf club. And of course, there was lots of golf books to read. But I had no interest in golf whatsoever. But there was this one book um, called, it was by a, a German doctor called Andrew Wiel, W-E-I-L. And it was called Eight Weeks to Optimum Health. Now, it's a very old book. It's probably 30 years old now, I'm sure. But... Um, um, I remember picking it up and thinking, oh my God, this is so boring. I cannot believe this is the only book that I have to read. But as I started reading the book, um, I began to become really, really, really interested. He broke down things like carbohydrates and proteins and fats. And he talked about chemicals in our water and about digital detoxes and about, you know, all how food basically affects the body and how food affects the body, nutrients affects the body. You know, what are the main causes of disease? He gave loads of different exercises for mindfulness and for, you know, to explain about the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. And the information just clicked with me. It just made sense. And I remember it, that is really when I was kind of 20 years of age, that was what spawned my journey into just wanting to understand the human body and just being absolutely fascinated with um, I guess making the human body work better, but also it never occurred to me that what I ate would have effect, have an effect on my health, my longevity, and all of that stuff. And I'd, I'd, I'd never even thought about reading the labels, you know, in supermarkets. And that was one of the first things the exercises he got people to do was to read the labels. He said never, never buy anything without first reading the ingredients label. And he said, if there's ingredients in the thing you're considering buying that you don't recognize the name of, or they're chemicals, or they have E-numbers, don't buy it. And I like, it, I had never thought about things like trans fats. I didn't even know what a trans fat was. Many of you probably don't even know here, but I'll explain in a second. I'd never thought about E-numbers. I'd never thought about chemicals. I'd never thought about preservatives. I'd never thought about any of that. I just saw food as food. Um, as far as I was concerned, if it was in the supermarket and the government was letting someone produce and sell it, well, then it must be okay to eat, right? So that is, and I was brought up in the country. So it was, you know, pastas and breads and potatoes. And now we had meat whenever I was younger, but it was meat and two veg and potatoes and, you know, desserts every single day. But they were homemade, you know, roly-poly jam puddings and sponge puddings and all that kind of stuff, but it was all home baked goods. But I'd never, so it never occurred to me, and a lot of people don't even think about reading the labels of things that they purchase in the supermarket, but it really got me very, very hyper, hyper aware of food. Now, before I move on, I know some of you are going to be going, oh, what is a trans fat? I do want to know that. So basically a trans fat is a hydrogenated fat or a partially hydrogenated fat. So basically what happens is um, in order to uh, use a fat in food such as cookies and cakes and biscuits and things that they serve that they sell in the supermarkets they want to give them a long shelf life but if they use traditional fats that you would use in home baking that my grandmother would have used such as you know margarines or um or butter or you know oils they would spoil very very quickly on a supermarket shelf so what they do is they take a fat that is normally um runny at room or liquid at room temperature such as, you know, rapeseed oil or um, vegetable oil or canola oil or those kinds of things. And they heat them to a really, really, really high temperature to force them to take on hydrogen atoms. So any fat that is solid at room temperature, such as butter or coconut oil or ghee, um, which is an Indian clarified butter, those are the only three saturated fats that an animal fat is saturated as well. Um, so animal fat and butter and coconut oil and ghee are the only saturated fats that exist in the world because they are saturated with hydrogen atoms. That's why they're called a saturated fat. And they're much more stable at room temperature because they're solid. So, and they have a longer shelf life, um, but not as long as a 
as a, a fat that has been forced to take on hydrogen atoms. So they take something like, say, a vegetable oil or rapeseed oil, they heat it to a really high temperature. It is forced to take on hydrogen atoms, which makes it solid at room temperature. And then they use that to bake, to, to make the cakes and, and goodies and baked goods that you would, you know, buy off the supermarket shelf. Unfortunately, though, whenever you force a fat to take on more hydrogen atoms by heating it to a really high level, what you do is you, you create a trans fat. It twists the molecular structure of the fat. So whenever your body eats it, it doesn't recognize the fat. It doesn't know what to do with it because it is not a natural food. And so basically it stores it in your fat tissue because it doesn't know how to process it. And they are very, very carcinogenic. So that's ca carcinogen means cancer forming. So you want to avoid trans fats as much as you possibly can because they are known carcinogens. So that was just a little... Um, that was just a little side note for you. And by the way, just but the more unstable a fat is, i.e. the less hydrogen atoms it has in its molecular structure, such as avocado oil or, you know, any of those really uh, polyunsaturated fats, those are called. The more unstable a fat is, the more unstable it is at room temperature, the more likely it is to twist its molecular structure. And so you never, ever want to heat any polyunsaturated fats. You only ever want to gently heat um Sat mono and saturated fats are fine, but also saturated fat is really what you only ever want to be cooking with. I do most of my cooking with like a processed coconut oil, which is tasteless um, because it's a very, very stable fat at room temperature. So, so after I had... Um, learned all this, I guess. And a lot of this came from, you know, I've gone on to study fats. I didn't learn all this from that first book, but I've gone on to study, you know, fat and carbs and proteins and the role of them in the body and how they affect the cells. Um, and so years then later, I, um, I always maintained a very healthy body weight, but I was skinny fat, you know, like I didn't train whenever I was younger in the gym. I did a lot of yoga and I, never ate a huge amount of food, but I didn't. And so although I understood how to eat for health, I didn't really understand how to eat to maintain or change my body composition. And it was only when I learned how to eat and change, um, eat to change or control my body composition, which is basically the distribution of fat, muscle, you know, and um, tissue in the body, that things really began to change for me. But having that very strong foundation of nutrition and eating for health really did help me whenever I began to study uh, body composition change. So whenever I was about, uh, it was about, let me think, 2013, 2014, so you're talking about eight years ago, I guess, I, dis I discovered a book, uh, I discovered Tim Ferriss. This is whenever I was trying to, I was starting to study, trying to build a business online, and I bought the four-hour work week the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. And I read it cover to cover and I thought it was amazing. And this is kind of what spawned and started my journey of me wanting to be wealthy or successful online. A lot of people think I was, you know, oh, she built a business in a year after she launched a Sculpted Vegan. Well, I didn't really. I spent like four to six years before that studying online marketing and trying and failing to build businesses. And so I just never, ever gave up. And that's why I was eventually successful. So I, I stumbled upon Tim Ferriss. I loved his body or I loved his book, The 4-Hour Workweek. And after The 4-Hour Workweek, I, I then went on to read others, you know, other books of his. And I found he had a book called The 4-Hour Body. Now, I've talked a bit about this book in the podcast. Um, it's a great book. It's like a fat loss book. Bible, if you like. And um, Tim really does, he really has learned how to hack the human body. Now, at the time, um, I read the book, I certainly did not have a lot of fat to lose, but I just loved experimenting. And so I read this book and I thought, you know what, I'm going to try the principles in this book because Tim broke it down into some very, very basic principles of for fat loss, which are a lot of the principles that I teach, but I do always credit Tim for my understanding of them. And the first one was, you know, no white starchy carbs. Um, and so he said, avoid all white starchy carbs. And then he also um, taught no liquid calories. So no like orange juices or alcohol or um, I don't know what sodas or anything like that. No fruit was the third one because of how your body breaks it down and stores it as fat tissue. So fruit cannot be used by the, the muscles as glycogen. It can't be stored in the muscles as glycogen. It is basically broken down into glucose and then stored in the liver and fat stores. So that's why fruit is, yes, very good for you. It's uh, very healthy, but it is definitely not 
bid for fat loss at all. So what was the other one? So no fruit. And then, oh yes, eat 30 grams of protein within within 30 minutes of waking up. That was another one of Tim's rules. And then the other one was have one cheat day per week. So make sure that you're you know having at least one refeed day per week. So it's funny because a lot of the principles that Tim teaches are actually a lot of bodybuilding principles. And in the book, The 4 Our Body, he did study a lot of bodybuilders. And that is where he got a lot of his information from. So I started eating that way because I finally understood. And Tim really broke down in this book the role of... Uh, what happens to carbohydrates in the body and how they affect the body. And that then, you know, sp- sent me spiraling off into another journey of discovery of, you know, looking at carbohydrates and slow carbs and starchy carbs and, and how they affect the blood sugar and all of that different stuff. And that is where I guess I got so knowledgeable about, you know, about all this information and so easy that, and once you really understand something and have studied it for a long time, you find it very easy to explain it, which I guess is why I find it easy to, um, to do stuff like this on the podcast. So let's talk um, a little bit about carbs. But so ever since reading, I guess, the For Our Body, I have never really gone back to eating the way I used to eat traditionally before that. So many people eat, you know, a very traditional standard American diet or here in the UK, it's a standard UK diet, which is basically, you know, whites consists of carbohydrates, but mostly they are things like breads, you know, easily readily available foods, breads, pasta, rice, potatoes, um, those kinds of things. Those are seen as, you know, main. if you said to somebody, what's a carbohydrate, they would say bread. What else? Potatoes. What else? Rice, pasta. So that's what we see as, um, as carbohydrates. And then, um, and so that that is what I would have would have eaten. But then, if you say to people, "What are sources of outside of meat? What are sources of protein?" Most people say beans, lentils, legumes, nuts, seeds, peanut butter, that kind of stuff, right? And while it's true, those are sources of protein, we don't see them as sources of protein in the Sculpted Vegan. For us, those are sources of carbs or fat. And protein would be, you know, like meat eaters would see meat as their main source of protein. We see things like seitan, sunflower mints, tofu, um, all those kinds of things. Those are source and protein powder. Those are sources of protein for us because they're sources of lean protein. So we're going to get into that in a wee second. So I guess that after I learned about slow carbs, which I'm going to explain, I continued to eat that way forever more. Like I, once I realized what slow carbs do to the body and what starchy carbs do to the body, I began to realize that I could eat a huge amount of food but not put on body fat. So in 2014, this is the way I started eating. And this is now 2022. Um, Listening to this, so eight years later, I started eating this way eight years ago, long before I became perimenopausal or before I became a bodybuilder, before I started doing anything professional in the world of um, of training and nutrition and, and exercising and fitness. And so I think that having this really, <clears throat> really strong foundation has helped me to um, has helped me to be successful in bodybuilding, and but has also allowed me to to draw on all of the principles that I learned and to incorporate them into all my bodybuilding programs, which is why we get such phenomenal results. So what you're going to be interested to learn uh, to do with menopause and and bodybuilding, I guess, is that eating for menopause is so that you don't put on a lot of body fat and you maintain your muscle mass is exactly the same as eating as a vegan bodybuilder. And whenever I began to study menopause, I began to realize I was like, oh my God, this is basically just what I teach. This is why women who join our shred programs, this is why women who join any of our programs actually have a massive reduction of menopausal symptoms once they start to follow our shred programs, simply because the way we we eat and the way we teach in the Sculpted Vegan in all of our programs is exactly the way you should eat to reduce your menopausal symptoms and reduce weight gain in menopause. So I couldn't believe that once I started realizing, you know, that once I started looking into it, that this was so, it kind of just seemed like, you know, a match made in heaven and like kind of the holy grail of of menopause, if you like, because of course I am perimenopausal. I'm 42 years of age. I'm nearly 43 and I am perimenopausal, even though, you know, my menstrual cycle is 
still very regular. I'm like clockwork every 26 days. Uh, last week, last month, it did actually come after 24 days. And I was like, ooh, that interesting. You know, that is, um, you know, obviously showing that, you know, things are starting to change a little bit. But I have never missed a period yet. But I pretty much think that I am going to be heading towards there now. But I do have obviously many friends and family and in my circle who are either perimenopausal or are menopausal. So I would say I'm kind of, yeah, I'm definitely perimenopausal or early perimenopausal, but I want to be prepared to know what's going to happen once I hit menopause. And of course, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of women in my network who are menopausal and who need help with this. So what I want to talk about today, primarily after that extremely long-winded introduction, um, what I want to talk about primarily is how you can eat so that you can either prevent weight gain in menopause. And I'm going to talk about why it even happens. I did explain it last week, but I'm going to recap it today. Um, so how you can eat to uh, to stop gaining weight in menopause or to maintain a current, current a healthy weight and also what you can do if you are menopausal or perimenopausal and you have started to gain a lot of weight and you just can't seem to get rid of it. I'm going to talk about what you can do as well. Okay. Now, because of how I've always eaten, which is using the principles of slow carbs, I haven't been hugely affected by the fat changes in menopause. Um, and it's really, people always used to say to me, oh, wait till you get to menopause. You're, you know, you're going to know all about it then. And I used to think, I don't think I am going to like, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to struggle in menopause simply because I'm very used to adapting to the changes in my body. If I put on a little bit of body fat, I know exactly how to lose. I'm very, very body conscious because I'm a professional bodybuilder and I run the world's largest online vegan bodybuilding company. So, and I know how to increase muscle mass and lose, you know, fat very quickly. So because I have so much data, I never thought that it would affect me, but now I want to be able to do is to teach that data to you guys. So, so, but let, let's actually, right, so let's recap, first of all, before we get into it, about what actually happens in menopause. So basically in menopause, you, well, whenever you are a female, in fact, let, let's go back, let's go back and talk about, first of all, how fat is distributed in the body. So let's go right back to puberty, first of all. So um, fat deposition, so where your body positions fat in the body changes with obviously with age and sex, right? So weight gain and, you know, fat deposits are similar in boys and girls until puberty. So whenever kids are young, you know, it's very hard to tell the difference between obviously long hair and, you know, how they're dressed and that kind of stuff. But in terms of body composition, it's very difficult to tell the difference between men, uh, little boys and little girls. But then once they become adolescent, boys start having, you know, higher testosterone levels and girls start having higher estrogen levels. So that's when the changes really start to happen girls begin to have a higher percentage of body fat and boys begin to have a higher percentage of muscle mass because testosterone causes higher muscle to fat ratio um, as well as it has more masculinizing, masculinizing effects such as, you know, obviously growing a bigger penis, <laughs> and, you know, pecs and, you know, and deeper voice and facial hair and all that kind of stuff. So estrogen causes a typical female fat distribution pattern to be in the breasts and the buttocks and the thighs. So you know what it's like. I'm watching my daughter Maya go through that at the minute. She's 12 and she's obviously, you know, entering puberty and she's starting to now, even though she's very lean because she rides horses like every single day and she's very active, she's starting to now put on a little bit more body fat around her thighs and her bum and her tummy and, you know, her breasts and stuff. And so she's starting to, you know, her body composition is starting to change. Whereas the boys, I'm watching the boys in my family, you know, put on, you know, have these massively broad shoulders and their pecs are growing and they all train very hard. But, you know, you can see that they're extremely lean around the areas where, you know, Maya, who's 12, is much, you know, is starting to pad out a little bit. So during um, the reproductive years, women get additional fat um, in their pelvis, their buttocks, their thighs, and their breasts. And interestingly, this is actually to provide an energy source for eventual pregnancy and lactation. Because if you think about it, our bodies are designed to actually give birth it whenever we're in our teens. That's when the body is primed to give birth. It's when our estrogen levels are highest. It's when our bodies are, you know, fit and healthy and our hormone production is highest and our milk production is highest. And so we are, and you know, for, for men, 
as well, their testosterone is actually highest whenever they're about 18 to 21. So that is actually, if Eve, from an evolutionary standpoint, that is when our bodies are primed to give birth and to reproduce, which is basically the what the human race is all about. You know, we are we're, we're built to to reproduce. So it's actually very easy for the body to break down fat deposits in the thighs and the and the the buttocks as energy sources and because we obviously did not have a constant supply of food whenever we were you know hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago thousands of years ago really whenever we were in very primitive times the body had to store fat as energy so in females because they because we get pregnant and have to breastfeed and feed our body breastfeeding requires an awful lot of energy the body tries to store fat in females as much as it can because it recognizes and your body doesn't know that we're living in 2022 and we have a constant access to food and to you know uh, and we don't have to you know go for periods of days or weeks without food so it doesn't know that it needs to you know doesn't need to store body fat in the same way so your body wants to store body fat as a female so that you can you know you can perform your primary function as far as it's concerned which is um which is having children and breastfeeding them so that is why your body tries to store more body fat now um paradoxically in menopause right a woman's estrogen levels are inversely related to her weight so what does this mean well i was actually reading a study of newly menopausal healthy women that was done over a four-year period and you know healthy women with a healthy bmi and you know no underlying health conditions who had just entered menopause and menopause means they haven't had a menstrual cycle for a year um the women showed an increase in weight and in body fat okay and it was it was absolutely um it was 100% of the women in the study showed an increase in weight and in body fat and then you know at the same time as the study during i think it was done by um oh it was one of the american universities i can't remember exactly who I could look up though and, and find out who it was, but in at the same time they were studying um, rats in or mice, sorry, in the laboratory. Now I'm not obviously pro animal testing in any way, but it, the, talking about the tests that they did on the mice is actually um, is relevant to what I'm talking about here. So I'm going to talk about it. Sorry if it offends you, but in the laboratory, when female mice were surgically thrust into menopause by removing their ovaries, only those mice treated with estrogen maintained their weight, while those deprived of estrogen rapidly gained weight. Isn't that interesting? So they basically surgically removed their ovaries, thrust them into menopause, and then they treated some of the mice with estrogen. So they gave them, you know, estrogen orally or injected it or whatever, and they didn't treat the other mice. And the ones that didn't get estrogen from an external source gained weight. So let's recap why this would be. Well, basically, um, estrogen basically incorporates crucial elements into our DNA responsible for weight control. And the absence of both estrogen um, and these crucial elements leads to progressive obesity unless the diet is controlled. So whenever you are in menopause and you're having hot flashes and irregular periods and irritability and depression and sleepless nights and all of those things, women also have a tendency to gain weight um, and visceral body fat, which is body fat around your internal organs. So subcutaneous fat is fat under the skin. Visceral fat is fat around your internal organs. Um, they they basically we we gain visceral fat and which also can affect your long-term health so why is this well because whenever you let actually hmm, let's talk about insulin next okay so whenever whenever you eat food your pancreas secrete a hormone called insulin this is just a quick recap of what we talked about last week if you want to go more in depth with this definitely go back and listen to last week so whenever you mm, i'm trying to think how i want to go i want to go with this uh okay let me recap here first let's 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 leave insulin for a second whenever you are um, having periods your ovaries produce estrogen okay and estrogen is responsible for a healthy weight gain or healthy weight level in the body. Why is it? Well, because your the primary source of, of estrogen in the body is your ovaries. 
whenever your ovaries stop producing eggs and your menstrual cycle as you move into perimenopause starts to become more irregular your estrogen levels drop because your bodies your ovaries produce estrogen whenever they're ovulating and then after ov ovulation the estrogen levels drop slightly they kind of go up and down throughout the month but as you stop having regular periods your estrogen levels drop now your body starts to recognize that your estrogen levels are dropping and it wants to keep your estrogen levels high because it's just not ready to give up on estrogen yet because it's responsible for many different functions in the body i'll talk about some of them in a second but um, your body is not re is not ready for your estrogen levels to drop. Now, a secondary, your body has two secondary sources of estrogen production. One is the adrenal glands and the other one is fat stores. So adipose tissue is very, very good at producing fats, at uh, producing estrogen. Now, it is a secondary source of, of estrogen production and your body doesn't normally need to rely on it because your ovaries are producing estrogen. But whenever your ovaries start Stop producing estrogen, your fat cells, um, your fat cells become almost, the, you know, as you move further into menopause, your fat cells become the primary source of estrogen. So what does your body want to do? Well, your body recognizes this and your body goes, hmm, okay, fat cells, great source of estrogen production. So what do we need to do to get more estrogen? Produce more fat cells. So because your body can't control what you eat, it can only control what happens on a cellular level within the body. It starts to it starts to create an insulin resistance in your cells. So your cells are normally really good at taking up uh, energy, taking up glucose from the blood and converting them into glycogen. So whenever you eat, and okay, let's go back and talk about food and how what happens. So whenever you eat, food goes into your small intestine, it goes into your small intestine first. Now it doesn't matter. This is a really, really important point. So I want you to listen. Okay. It doesn't matter what food makes it into your stomach. That is not important. So a lot of people feel guilty when they feel full. They're like, oh my God, I feel so full. And you know, I've eaten far too much. It doesn't actually matter how much you eat. How much you eat is not responsible for your body fat composition. What you eat is responsible for body fat composition. Why? Because it's not important what makes it into your stomach. It's important what makes it into your bloodstream. So once you eat food, it goes into your stomach. Then it is passed into your small intestine and it is broken down. That's its first. That's the first stage of digestion. So only food or primarily food that is broken down in the small intestine makes it into the bloodstream. And once it makes it into the bloodstream, your body then decides how much of that food or how much of those nutrients or how much of the glucose in what you eat will be used to fuel your cells and your tissues and what will be stored as fat. So it isn't important what makes it into your stomach. It's important what makes it into your bloodstream. So what you eat is much more important than how much you eat. And if you take nothing away from, your, from this podcast today, let that be the only thing that you take away. So once you, whenever you eat, your body breaks the food down or whatever it can in the small intestine into, um, into nutrients basically. But the most important one for your, for your uh, body weight regulation is glucose. So your body will break down carbohydrates into glucose and it will feed them into the bloodstream. Now, once the glucose is in your bloodstream, your body will, your, your cells will uptake that glucose and it will convert the glucose into glycogen. Glycogen is basically stored energy. Now, biologically speaking, carbohydrates are just molecules that contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms in specific ratios. And one of the primary functions of carbohydrates is like literally just to provide your body with energy. And so most of the carbohydrates in the foods that we eat are digested and broken down into glucose before, before they even enter the bloodstream. And then your cells convert them to glycogen. So just to recap, I like to recap a lot <laughs> just because sometimes I find that you don't get it the first time and the second or third time you hear it, you go, oh, right. Okay. I've totally, I, I, I've got it now. So the food makes it into your stomach. You chew it, goes into your stomach. you then it's passed through into the small intestine. Your body breaks down whatever it can break down in the small intestine. And then it, it, it basically converts it 
it into glucose. It puts it into the bloods, into the bloodstream. The minute you start eating, your pancreas, okay, start to secrete insulin. Insulin is a storage hormone. So insulin is released into your bloodstream in a flood. Insulin goes around your bloodstream. It picks up the glucose in your blood and it basically, it's almost like insulin knocks on the door of your cells and goes, hello, hello, do you need anything? And basically then your cells go, oh yeah, yeah, we need some of that. And they, your cells open the cell, the cell walls, the surface of the cell walls, they absorb the glucose in and they turn it into glycogen or they do, you know, lots of other things with it. Actually, Glu glucose in the blood is, is actually just to be all sciencey about it, is taken up um, by the body cells to produce a fuel molecule called adenosine triphosphate or ATP for short, adenosine triphosphate. And so, and this is done through a, a series of complex procedures known as cellular respiration, but you don't really need to know about cellular respiration. Cells then use um, the ATP, the um, adenosine tri triphosphate to perform a variety of metabolic tasks, such as what? Well, such as, you know, growing your nails or growing your hair or producing saliva or, you know, making muscle tissue or breaking down muscle tissue or basically met the metabolism basically is anything which is broken down and then rebuilt. So your body breaks things down and rebuilds things. And that is what your metabolism is. And that is what is that is what happens whenever all of this stuff is absorbed, all the energy is absorbed into your cells. However, in menopause, the cells become insulin resistant. Insulin resistance um, is basically when your cells in your muscles, your fat and your liver don't respond well to insulin. And when glucose can't, and they can't use the glucose from your blood for energy. So basically your body is trying to give your muscles, your fat and your liver, which are th your three primary organs, there's your kidneys and everything as well, and your heart, obviously, but your, your muscles can store glycogen, your liver can store glycogen to fuel the brain, and fat stores can convert glycogen into triglycerides and store them as future energy sources. Now, let's just circle back to why your body wants to do this. Well, your body, it, your body's main goal is to keep you alive, and as a woman, your body's main goal is to reproduce. So your body, even during, even before you have hit menopause, don't, you know, think about it, even when you're in perimenopause, your body, you can still have a baby. So your body still wants to, you know, keep, you know, your ability to have a baby going because it wants you to reproduce because that keeps the human species alive. Okay. Understand? Good. So basically your um, cells and your muscles, your fat and your liver stop responding to insulin and to make up for it, your pancreas make more insulin. So they go, okay, maybe the reason why the cells aren't taking up the insulin is because there's not enough insulin. So they start secreting more insulin. So you have more and more and more insulin in your blood. What happens here? Well, because the cells are going, no, no, all closed up today. We're not accepting any glucose. Thank you. More glucose is diverted to fat cells in the body, which means you put on more body fat. Why is this important? Because your body wants more fat cells to produce more estrogen. Yes, yeah, see how this happens? So up until the point when you reach perimenopause, everything is just happening normally. That's why suddenly you start to go, I haven't done anything differently. Why am I putting on this body fat? It's not because you've done anything differently. It's not anything that you have physically done or how you've changed your diet. Although most women who are perimenopausal do become slightly less active because usually our children are more grown and we're not running around after babies all day and picking stuff up and being more active. We are generally less active, even though we don't realize it. It's because your body on a cellular level is trying to divert more of the energy that you're eating into fat stores so that those fat stores can produce more estrogen because estrogen is extremely important in the body and your and your body is not ready to give up on it yet. Make it the sense? Okay. So a lot of people then go on to say, well, maybe I should just, should not eat carbs. Carbs are bad. And then we go back to, I knew carbs were bad. I just knew they were bad all these years. Kim's been telling me that I need to eat them to build muscle, but I knew carbs were bad. Well, carbs aren't bad in themselves. And you don't want to ever completely cut carbs out from the diet because the body will break down muscle tissue into amino acids for energy and the body needs muscle when you're menopausal because it helps to raise the metabolism by burning more calories. <laughs> so you don't ever want to cut carbs out, but there is a there is an answer to all of this 
um, which comes back to the slow carbs that we talked about in the in the beginning. So now you understand the rule of of why your body wants to store more body fat in menopause, what insulin resistance is and how the body metabolizes food and how it's not important what makes it into your bloodstream, what kinds it's important what makes it into your stomach. Now we need to talk about, well, what do you do when you're in perimenopausal or menopausal to either stop your body from storing fat or to um, to lose the body fat that you have accumulated. Well, basically you have to change how you eat. Now, if you have been um, following any of my Sculpted Vegan programs, or if you have been in my uh, in my company for a while and using different programs and following the principles that we teach, then you are likely eating this way anyway and probably don't have much of a problem. But if you're not, then listen up, sister, because this one is for you. So the only way for you to lose the meno belly or to, um, to, to stop your body from putting on body fat uh, because it wants to produce more estrogen is to change how you eat. Before we go on, I have to say that, by the way, it's not your body doesn't also recognize when it should when it should stop being insulin resistant. It doesn't say, "Oh, that's fine. We have enough fat now. We don't need to st- we don't need to produce any more fat because we are producing enough estrogen." No, no, no. When when your body recognizes that your menstrual cycles are stopping and your estrogen level and your ovaries are not producing estrogen anymore, all your body wants to do is to is to have is to produce more estrogen. And so if we and here's the wonderful thing, right? If we didn't overeat, if we went back to our ancestral times, to our primitive times where food was not, food was sparse and we had to, you know, we were physically active and we had, we were berry pickers and we didn't get fed all the time. This cycle would be perfect. We would have no extra body fat. There would be no overweight people because your body would regulate perfectly. The problem is we live in a modern world where we have access to all kinds of shite that we shouldn't be eating and we're not really educated on food and we have a lot of processed white starchy carbs. So we interrupt the body's natural metabolic process by uh, basically feeding it a whole pile of crap. And so your body would, would regulate this perfectly if we didn't live in a modern world, but because we do live in a modern world, you need to educate yourself so that you can allow the body to do what it needs to do. How do you educate yourself? Well, you have to change what you do. You have to change how you eat. You basically have to start eating, start avoiding all white starchy carbs if you can. Not all white starchy carbs, but most white starchy carbs. And you need to start eating more green cruciferous vegetables. Because whenever you eat a white starchy carb, what happens is it goes into the stomach. It is Then it moves into the small intestine. Your body can break down carbs very, very, very well in the small intestine. But what your body cannot break down in the small intestine is fiber. There are two types of fiber. There's soluble fiber and there is um, insoluble fiber, okay? So basically, soluble fiber passes through the small, as it passes through the small intestine, it binds to bile acids and then it prevents, to prevent them from being reabsorbed because bile acids are produced by the stomach and then they're released into the digestive system um, so that you can it can help to break down the food, right? So you don't want those to be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. So they bind to the uh, soluble fiber inside the small intestine and then they're carried through the large intestine and then they're carried out as poop, okay? So to make more bile acids, basically the liver uses cholesterol that would otherwise be used in the blood. So again, nobody ever has high cholesterol if they... Don't eat animals because your body makes exactly the amount of cholesterol that it needs. The only time that people have high cholesterol is because they they eat animal products. They eat cheese and butter and animal fats, which are filled with cholesterol. So let's talk about cholesterol for a little second. This is why a lot of these problems as well all happen as we get older and in menopause. So whenever you uh, whenever you eat cholesterol from an external source, your body sends the cholesterol to the liver, okay, through the blood. So it gathers the cholesterol up in the in the, the blood and it sends it to the liver to be processed. The liver then uses the cholesterol to make bile acids, which it feeds into the gallbladder. Whenever you eat, the gallbladder releases the bile acids in a flood into the digestive system, which acts like um, pouring uh, liquid detergent into, you know, to break down, just like you would pour over here, we have fairy liquid. You squirt that into um, a pan, a greasy pan, and it helps to break down the fat cells so you can wash the pan. That's 
that's basically what your gallbladder does with bile acids. It releases them into the, um, into the digestive system to help break down the fats. So then the soluble fiber uh, binds to those bile acids and then it carries them out of uh, out, out of the body through your poop. Now, if you eat cholesterol, then you interrupt the very delicate balance of cholesterol production in the body because your body will make exactly the amount of cholesterol that it needs. So whenever you have excess cholesterol in your blood, your body then, um, your liver keeps trying to process it and process it and process it. But whenever it can't process it quickly enough because there's just too much, then of course the cholesterol starts sticking to the intestinal walls um, of, and that's that's what basically causes heart disease. It starts sticking to your arteries. You don't have a good absorption of nutrients into the cells and it can block the arteries and that is why people get heart disease. Heart disease is basically someone who's eaten too much cholesterol in their lives and their body hasn't been able to get rid of it. It's also why you get gallstones because your gallbladder um, is a beautifully functioning piece of equipment but whenever you eat too much cholesterol, it basically causes gallbladder sludge because the cholesterol builds up in the gallbladder because the liver obviously makes uses the cholesterol to make bile acids, but so it keeps feeding it into the um, into the gallbladder, and then eventually gallstones form, which are basic. Gallstones are just calcified cholesterol. That's all they are. So if you eat too many animal products, which hopefully many of you don't, because you're probably vegan if you're listening to this, or actually many many of you aren't vegan. But basically, just know that that is what eating animal products does. It causes. Um, it can cause all kinds of problems like, you know, and gallbladder problems. And one of the best ways to stop gallbladder problems is literally just to cut all animal products out of your diet. So, okay, now you've had a biology lesson <laughs> about cholesterol. Let's go back to talking about slow carbs. So whenever you eat uh, a white starchy carb, a white starchy carb is basically just a carbohydrate where the fiber has been removed. That is how, uh, that is what a refined carb is. Many people have heard of a refined carb, but they don't really know what it is. So basically all carbs are, come from whole sources, but the more fiber they remove from the whole source, such as white rice or, you know, whenever they break down white flour and they pull out all of the husks and the grains, the more fiber has been removed, the um, the faster it will move through your, be absorbed into your bloodstream. That is why if you drink apple juice, the sugar will just be absorbed into the bloodstream immediately. But if you eat a whole apple, your body will have to break it down much slower. So if you remove the fiber from the grain, then it is absorbed into the bloodstream much, much more quickly. In the Sculpted Vegan, whenever we are muscle building or after training, we actually try to eat white starchy carbs because our muscles are crying out for muscle glycogen. So if we eat a white starchy carb directly after training, we want it to be absorbed quickly into the bloodstream so that it can be fed into the muscle tissue where they are literally open. The muscle tissue, the cells of the surface are open because of the GLUT4 receptors. It's another biology lesson. And basically the carbs are absorbed into the cells and then the muscles use them and then the muscles grow and repair quicker. So it's really good to eat white starchy carbs directly after training, but if you're not eating them directly after training, it's best to avoid them, especially if you are, that's the only time I'll eat a white starchy carb, by the way, is directly after training. Otherwise I avoid them. So the, the more a carb has been broken down, the faster is it, it, is, it is absorbed into the bloodstream. The faster it is absorbed into the bloodstream, the more rapidly the glucose in the blood rises. The more rapidly it rises, the quicker insulin is released into the bloodstream to reduce the glucose levels into the, in the bloodstream. And of course then, because your body is now causing insulin resistance within your cells, the faster those carbs are re-diverted to fat. So how do you stop putting on fat in perimenopause or menopause? You stop stop eating white starchy carbs. You go to slow carbs. Now, what are slow carbs? Slow carbs are basically carbs which um, are which are very fibrous. So I like to describe them as anything. So a white starchy carb is anything that was white, is white, or could be white. So I avoid all brown pasta, brown rice, brown bread, anything which is white, was white, or could be white, you want to avoid. Okay. Now brown rice, of course, is better than white rice, but your body still, it's still a very high glycemic index carb and your body will still absorb the carbs because of the insulin resistance in and store them as fat because you're still dumping a huge amount of carbs into the bloodstream, even though it is coming in slower, it's still a huge amount of carbs just being fed in, in slightly slower. But if you change all of your carb intake to slow carbs, then your body will just get a constant slow drip of energy. Slow carbs are 
Um, any green cruciferous vegetables. So not carrots or turnips. Those are very high sugar vegetables. Of course, they are better than the alternatives, but you know, nothing that got a green cruciferous vegetable. Now, cauliflower also falls under this, even though it's not green, but it is a cruciferous vegetable. So crucifers are vegetables that basically are grown in the ground, okay? Or sorry, above the ground. So if it's, they're, they're always grown above the ground. So spinach, green beans, um, asparagus, broccoli, uh, kale, kohlrabi, uh, like I said, cauliflower. Um, there's millions more of them. But so you want to look at specifically green cruciferous vegetables. Those are an amazing source of slow release energy. Also, beans, legumes, um, chickpeas are, uh, chickpeas act more like a white starchy carb, so you kind of want to avoid them, but any kinds of beans um, are also a really good slow carb. So what happens whenever you eat these slow carbs? Well, because the, the majority of them are fiber, both soluble and insoluble fiber, not a lot of it makes it, not a lot of the food makes it into the bloodstream. So remember we talked about it's not important what makes it into your stomach, it's what makes it into your bloodstream that counts. You could eat two whole heads of broccoli. And believe me, sometimes I do when I'm shredding. I eat an entire, I eat two whole heads of broccoli steamed. But because the majority of that broccoli is fiber, I'm only getting the nutrients from the broccoli. I'm, I'm feeling full and I'm getting an enormous amount of nutrients because it's so high in nutrients, but very little of it is being absorbed into the bloodstream because most of the broccoli and the green beans and the asparagus, which are my three favorite vegetables, most of them are fiber. So they're not absorbed into the bloodstream as energy. They're, they're, they're sent through to the large colon to be fermented and passed out as poop. Isn't that amazing? And so beans are actually, um, beans are really a really high source of insoluble fiber, which are basically used for roughage. So any kind of beans or seeds or anything like that, um, you know, soluble fiber is basically uh, draws water into the boil and makes it like a gel-like substance. So um, soluble fiber is really important for passing of, you know, smooth stools whenever you go to the toilet. But the uh, the roughage is caused by insoluble fiber. And insoluble fiber comes more from the likes of beans and that kind of stuff. So basically whenever I'm shredding and I'm just eating protein and green cruciferous vegetables, vegetables, I literally poop five times a day. I'm not even kidding. Like five times a day. Every time I go for a wee, I poop and it's pleasant. <laughs> I was going to say it's long and it's thin and it just boop, just comes out and my, it just passes through my body so quickly because I'm not eating a huge amount of roughage, okay? Which is fine. And that's totally, totally okay. But you do want to have a balance of both if you can. So but that, so that, that's basically what, what slow carbs are. And your body gets a slow, sustainable drip of energy and it can use this energy immediately, leaving very little for fat stores. So don't forget, if you have glucose in your blood, your body is still going to release insulin when you eat slow carbs. The insulin is still going to try to store the energy, but because it's not trying to store an enormous amount of energy, it's only trying to store a small amount of energy, then the glucose that is, that is well, actually quite often, a lot of it isn't even stored because whenever you have glucose in your blood, glycogen is stored energy but glucose is energy that's readily available now so because you know if you're fairly active during the day whenever you eat say two heads of broccoli that glucose is going to be in your blood but you're because it's only a small amount of glucose you're probably going to use that energy immediately you're going to have an immediate use for that energy source and so if um, it's only if you don't have an immediate use for that energy source that it will be stored as glycogen but because it's such a small amount you will use most of it immediately and not a lot of it will be stored and because not a lot of it will be stored the insulin resistance won't cause a lot of it to be diverted to fat store isn't that just fucking fascinating are you not just loving this? And I know there's very few stories here and I know I'm speaking very fast and I'm teaching very fast, but hopefully you're understanding what I'm saying and you've had loads of aha moments. Okay, so what does a slow carb diet look like? Many people are like, okay, Kim, well, this all sounds very well and good, but what the hell do I eat for breakfast? Well, I'll tell you a very kind of a typical diet of mine, if you like. So breakfast for me will normally be oatmeal with protein powder. Now oats, even though they are a white starchy carb, 
technically are very 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 slowly broken down by the body because they're more they act more like a seed or a nut okay because they have a husk on them and obviously you don't want to be using like really 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 processed oats you want to be using the oats that are um you know i think in america they have steel cut oats those are great or you want to be using the jumbo oats the ones that aren't really 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 well broken down because the more they're broken down the more fiber is removed the faster they are absorbed so you want to be using oats that are um not broken down as quickly you cook some oats with um I just use water in my oats and then I add a scoop of vanilla protein powder. I will top with some cinnamon, which is great for blood sugar regulation. And I will also um, top with a handful of blueberries. And that is usually my breakfast. Now, sometimes I have some scrambled tofu on the side, or if I'm shredding, I will have a very small amount of oats, maybe like 20 grams of oats. And I will have a seitan chicken breast, which my chef has made for me. And I will have that sliced up on the side, or I will have, you know, half a block of scrambled tofu, but tofu is quite high in fat. So it is something that I have to really be careful of whenever I'm shredding. But I will have a lean protein sliced up on the side and I will eat my oatmeal. And then afterwards, just with a fork, I will just eat my seitan chicken breast. And that is my usual breakfast. Or you can have, you know, just scrambled tofu with um, another great breakfast idea. If you'd like savory breakfast more than sweet, you can have scrambled tofu with some black beans and some spinach. Black beans and spinach are amazing sources of not only um, insoluble and soluble fiber, but but um, the, the spinach is more soluble fiber and the black beans are more insoluble fiber. Both are important. They're, they also have protein in them. They're a really slow releasing carb energy. And then you're getting the high protein from the scrambled tofu. Um, or what else could you have? You could have, uh, now peanut butter is a source of fat. A lot of people say, oh, peanut butter is a great source of protein. It is, but it's also very, very, very calorific. It's 80 calories in five grams. And you would be shocked at how little five grams is. It's a, it's a, it's a teaspoon. It's not even a heaped or a rounded teaspoon. It's a scraped across the top teaspoon. So if you have three very flat teaspoons, you're talking 240 calories. Okay. Not a good choice, but you could, if you weren't, you know, if you weren't dieting or if you had a slightly lower BMI, you could have um, some peanut butter on some, you know, wholemeal toast. And you're like, but I thought you said we can't have toast. Well, like everything in moderation. Okay. One slice of wholemeal toast with seeds is a far better option than a slice of white toast. So, and listen, we all have to have a sustainable lifestyle here. I'm just saying you have to educate yourself on making better choices. Now, um, and if also if you have like a sprouted bread, that's really good. We get this um, from the health food shop. We get this raw sprouted bread, uh, which has very, very few ingredients, which is just really high in fiber. And that would be fine too. But you always make sure you have your protein in the morning. You want to make sure you have your 30 grams of protein within 30 minutes of waking up. That is so important for boosting the metabolism. So what is lunch? Well, every day lunch for me is some kind of vegan protein. Most people just have kind of meat on their lunch if they're, if they're meat eaters. So I will have a vegan chicken breast, either a seitan chicken breast or something which is bought from the store, or I will have um, some kind of uh, vegan beef substitute, which again, my chef makes. He makes all kinds of vegan pork and beef and fish. He makes these amazing fish cakes, or um, he does this fish thing where he freezes tofu he, he slices it up and freezes it, which makes it slightly more firm. And then he wraps it in nori and seaweed. And then he kind of dips it in, um, I don't know, some kind of egg substitute. And then in very, very fine panko bread breadcrumbs. And then he fries them and bakes it in the oven. And I swear to God, it's like eating a piece of fish. It's absolutely fucking amazing. So um, we, I would have that for lunch with a salad on the side, loads of green cruciferous vegetables. So I, and maybe some seeds or some nuts. But again, don't forget seeds and nuts are sources of fat. So you want to really limit your consumption of seeds and nuts. But most of my most of my food, most of my carbs come from green cruciferous vegetables, but sometimes I will eat beans as well. But very, 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 very rarely will I have rice, unless it's post um I'm post-workout. I will very very rarely have rice or never eat pasta ever. If we're having potatoes, I will have white or so I will have sweet potato. Sweet potato is also fine to eat. It is still quite, if you're trying to shred body fat and you've got a lot of body fat to lose in menopause, I would avoid all potatoes. Instead, you can try celeriac. Celeriac is really good potato substitute, or you could also try, I'm trying to think, turnip is still quite sweet, but it is lower in carbs than, um, than potatoes. So that's also a good alternative. So look for vegetables that act like a potato, taste like a potato, make you feel like you're eating a potato, but aren't actually potatoes. Those are really good options whenever you're trying to lose body fat. 
And again, don't, don't confuse beans with being protein. Beans are not protein. Beans are carbs. A lot of people, whenever you say to them, oh, what are, you know, vegan sources of protein? And they're really not, are not educated. They say, oh, you know, beans, nuts, seeds. I'm like, no, no, no. Beans are a carb source and nuts and seeds are a protein source. You have to rethink, re-educate how you do, how you do your food. Um, and let me see. So protein, protein basically, and again, dinner is much the same, right? Dinner really is much the same. And also if I'm having like a, say our chef made like a, a lasagna, I get them to, well, I don't always know because like I'm, I'm not at this stage. Yet. I'm very, very, very lean and I expend an enormous amount of calories. So I don't need to eat this way. I do. If we're having a vegan lasagna, I will have the vegan lasagna, but you can make a vegan lasagna with slices of courgette in, or a zucchini instead of pasta sheets. You know, there's so many different ways you can substitute vegetables for uh, for the, the pasta that you would normally have. Like whenever I started eating this way, if if we ever had something like spaghetti bolognese, uh, instead of having the spaghetti, I would have courgette. So I would, you know, do a, use a spiralizer to make um, courgette or zucchini noodles. And I would eat those on the side, or I would just have some beans or some lentils on the side. That's another really good one, lentils. So I, I buy the packets of lentils, the packets of pre-cooked lentils or jars or tins of lentils. I would, or cans of lentils, as you call them in America. I just realized when I was calling something a tin the other day, I was like a tin of lentils. The Americans were like, what is a tin? I was like a tin can. They were like, oh, a can. So it's funny how its real name is a tin can, but we call it a tin and you call it a can. So cans of lentils, really good to eat with the likes of scrambled tofu. Or, you know, if you're having lunch, then you would have your vegetables, you would have your portion of lentils, and then you would have your vegan seitan chicken. Or if you're, if you're a meat eater, you could have whatever pro, meat protein source um, you, you've decided to eat with it. And, you know, dinner again is much the same. So protein sources as a vegan um, are, you know, seitan, tofu, any soy products, sunflower mince is a really, really good one. So that's ha it's like a beef hashe um, or beef mince, we call it here, but made with sunflower seeds, super high in protein, really low in fat and carbs, excellent protein source. And protein powder as well. Don't forget if you're a vegan bodybuilder, or even if you're not a bodybuilder, protein powder is a really, really good source of lean protein. And don't forget also that small amounts of white starchy carbs are fine, okay? Small amounts are fine, especially if you are training, but the bulk of your food should be from slow carb sources. And if you eat this way, you can literally eat as much as you want um, and maintain a very healthy body fat weight or body weight. I never, ever count green cruciferous vegetables in my macros. Like I don't, I don't count them as... A, either in our network, they're considered free food. So you can eat as much of the broccoli, asparagus, kale, kohlrabi, all that stuff. You can eat as much of that as you want. Um, and you don't have to count it. If you're calorie counting, you don't have to enter those into my fitness pal. Peas are not a green cruciferous vegetable. They are sweet and sugary. So you want to count those. So it's only green crucifers. And if you just look up Google, like what are green cruciferous vegetables, you will get a list of green cruciferous vegetables. But don't forget, cauliflower is also a green, uh, well, it's also a cruciferous. Now, before we finish, just one last thing I want to say is don't forget that the more you move, the more calories you will burn. So whenever you eat food, it is broken down in the small intestine as glucose and fed into the bloodstream. Your body will keep the glucose in the bloodstream for immediate energy sources. It will only store it as glycogen if the, if the energy is not used immediately or there's no required or it isn't required immediately. So don't forget that the more you move in menopause or in life, the more of the glucose is going to be used immediately and not stored as glycogen. So like I would do an average on, on a bad day. My bad day is 15,000 steps. That's a day when I'm sitting in my office all day, 15,000 steps. An average day for me is 25 to 35,000 steps. So I move a lot. You have to get into the habit of moving a lot. Be up, be down, be energetic, take the stairs, you know, go for a walk at lunchtime, you know, park your car further away so you have to get more steps in. I m monitor my steps every day because it helps me to be very focused on it. And if you set a daily step goal, don't even set like, oh, I'm going to do 30 minutes exercise a day. Say, I'm going to do 15,000 steps a day. Set a daily step goal and then just constantly check it throughout the day. And if you're watching TV at night and you've only hit 12,000 steps, get up and walk around your house or walk around your living room. So, or walk on a treadmill while you're watching something. You just want to make sure that you're active and you get your steps in because the more active you are, the more glucose your body will use, the less it will store as glycogen, the less it will divert to fat stores, which is how you maintain a healthy weight in menopause. So there you have it. Menopause part two. 
Hopefully you enjoyed this. Now, there's a couple of things coming up, which I have to tell you about, which is, and I had this brainwave while I was teaching there. So we are releasing a menopause program in April 2022, and it's called the Menno Belly. And it's basically going to be an exact program of how to eat, how to train. It's going to be a brand new training program that you can do at home to shred the Menno Belly, incorporating all of the principles that I have taught in here. And instead of having meal plans, we're going to have here are different calorie count breakfast options. Here are calorie count lunch options, snack options, dinners. So you can build your own meal plan. So we'll teach you how to figure out how much you should be eating for weight loss or maintenance. And then we will give you options so you can build your own meal plans every day rather than following a prescriptive meal plan that we have given you. And we're going to have like incredible workouts from home, which are going to be excellent for fat burning, which only take like 30 to 45 minutes. And you're going to absolutely love it. So that's the first thing. Second thing is we also have two master classes coming up for you. I'm going to, I definitely know I'm going to do one, but I just realized during this podcast that one of our most popular master classes that I taught over three hours was the um, meal planning master class, which I basically taught how to meal plan as a vegan bodybuilder. I am going to host another master class and I'm going to host it for uh, for menopausal women. And I'm going to teach everything I've just taught here, but break it down into very, very, very easy to understand format for menopausal women. So basically it's going to be meal meal planning in menopause. And um, I'm going to do meal plans. And I'm going to do, you know, uh, worksheets and all the rest of it. So that is act- that is definitely going to be coming up soon. It'll be like a three hour masterclass, but it really will give women um, an education as to how to eat in menopause. Uh, the third thing that we're going to do is I'm going to do a... Um, slightly later in the year, I think at the end of April, we're going to do another masterclass on the menopause belly. And that's going to be a three hour masterclass breaking down, you know, kind of a lot of the stuff I've talked about here. So you guys may not need it, but it will have very specific information and training um, on how to get rid of the menopause belly. We're going hard on menopause this year because a lot of the women in my network have now matured into menopause and it is something that they are focusing on. And it is something that is becoming much, much more prevalent in the world. I always say, tell people that menopause is the new veganism. Veganism is on the rise. Menopause is awareness of menopause is on the rise um, because it's something we never used to speak about years ago. And I'm so excited to be able to bring you all of this knowledge and all of these resources. And also don't forget before you go that we have a menopause group called Menopause Matters. It's $97 a year to join. Um, Anyone who joins Menopause Matters where we do lives and we do Q and A's and we talk all about all the stuff that you're learning here, we do inside the menopause group. We have guests experts come in every month. But um, anyone who's a member of that group, once we launch the menopause program, the um, the Menabelli one in April, anyone who's paid $97 to be a member of that group will have their $97 refunded. Whenever they purchase, if they choose to purchase the new program, we will refund the the new program. I think it'll be 197 or maybe 297. Uh, 297, I think it is because it's a three month program, but we will refund the $97 that you chose to purchase or that you used to purchase that program if you choose to upgrade into the new program once we release it. So if you want to get in on our menopause group right now, there's only like 150 people in it. So you get loads of one-to-one attention. Um, if you want to join it, there's a link in the show notes. Um, I think you can also go to the website and go to programs in the menu at the top and the group will be there. You can purchase the group, $97 for the year. You can, um, but I said you will have it refunded if you buy the new one. Uh, I think we had like 10 people join last week after listening to the podcast. So I wanted to just put it out there as an option for you guys, for anyone listening link will be in the show notes. And lastly, um, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate your time and your attention. I'm sorry I went over an hour because you always complain when I do because your cardio is an hour and then you have to listen to the rest later. So I'll try and keep them shorter in future, but there's a lot of information to give. So sometimes shit happens and you just have to suck it up, princess. Okay. Have a wonderful week wherever you are. I love you loads. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. So great to be back doing these regularly and I will catch you next week for another episode of the Kim Constable podcast. Have a wonderful week and I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.